Hello and welcome to Did You Know Gaming Extra. In this episode, we'll be exploring some trivia behind a number of titles for the Nintendo 64. The Nintendo 64 was originally created under the working title of the Ultra 64, as a tribute to several toys manufactured by Nintendo in the late 1960s, such as the Ultra Hand. However, as Konami still held the trademark on the name Ultra Games, Nintendo elected to change the name and logo for their new console. The system was created at a time when Nintendo's competition was particularly fierce, being released a year after Sony's first entry into the console market race with the PlayStation. With that said, the device received rave reviews, despite being criticised for its comparatively slim lineup of titles. One of the more popular titles on the N64 was Star Fox 64. Despite all versions being released within six months of each other internationally in 1997, there are still a few regional differences. An obvious change comes with the game being in a different language, however, the PAL version, Lilat Wars, went one step further than simply translating the game into English. It's the only version that features language settings, and the player is even able to set the language to Lilat. This makes all the characters in-game speak gibberish, in reference to the game's predecessor for the Super Nintendo. Damn it, damn it, damn it. The Japanese version has different dialogue as well. The Western versions of the game have Fox's teammates yell no! when being shot down, whereas the Japanese version has them cry Fox's name. Fox this isn't the only change, as the Japanese version's character icons also do not sync up with the character's dialogue, unlike the English versions. Just three months after the success of Star Fox 64 and its introduction of the Rumble Pack, Super Mario 64 and Wave Race 64 both received re-releases in July 1997, exclusively in Japan. Both titles were updated with special Shindu Pak Tayo editions. The main focus for these releases was to add compatibility with the Rumble Pack. Wave Race's inclusion was vibration that matched the engine of the jet ski and reactions to jumps and waves by jolting the player. In Mario 64, the rumble feature kicks when the player is attacked or being attacked by an enemy. It rumbles with ground pounds, forward dives, and when collecting a red coin or an extra life. The rumble pack also vibrates when stretching Mario's face in the title screen. Wave Race 64 has a few more changes added to the game that weren't present in the original. The announcer's inflection was changed. Wave Race! Wave Race! Two of the tracks from the soundtrack were remixed, and a ghost was added into the time trial mode in the form of a dolphin. Mario 64 Shindu Edition has quite a few differences, however. It includes changes made for the international release of the game that didn't appear in the original Japanese version, such as voice clips and the ability to press A or B when interacting with NPCs or signs instead of just B. An odd glitch was removed where Mario would receive 99 lives if the coin count went above 999. This bug would break the game and display M25 instead of 99 lives. This version also fixes the backwards long jump oversight present in all previous versions. An easter egg was even added to the game. If the player presses Z on the title screen, a spiral of screen showing Mario's head will appear. Another more unusual change is that if Mario jumps onto a tree, he will slide round and face the camera instead of facing the direction in which he jumped. Another N64 peripheral that didn't quite garner the same popularity was the Biosensor. The Biosensor was released by SATA exclusively in Japan and came bundled with Tetris 64. The device was designed to clip onto the player's ear and read their pulse. Initially designed specifically for Tetris 64, the game reacted with the player's pulse. Based on how stressed the player becomes while playing, the block's falling speed will increase or slow down accordingly. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask is a much-beloved game that has many distinctive features. One of its more distinctive features for Zelda fans is that it reused many assets from Ocarina of Time, but this reusing of art and resources goes even further than you might think. Inside the moon, there is a small bird that flies around the tree. This bird model was originally used in a beta version of Ocarina of Time, but was cut in the final release. It found a second life within Majora's Mask, along with many other Ocarina of Time assets. Chameleon Twist 2, developed by Japan System Supply and published by Sunsoft, was released in 1998 in Japan and 1999 internationally. Unlike the Japanese release, the international versions had radically altered designs compared to the first game. The cute humanoid characters from the original were scrapped for a more realistic-looking chameleon design. It's thought that these changes were made to help the game sell outside of Japan. Davy and Jack's colors were also switched, and Rinda was changed to Linda. 
Pokemon Puzzle League is a very unusual case, particularly for a Pokemon title. The game was never actually released in Japan, only appearing in North American and PAL regions in 2000 and 2001 respectively. The game is the spiritual successor to Puzzle League, also known as Panel de Pon, but of course featuring Pokemon characters. It was never made clear as to why it never received a release in Japan, despite the game receiving respectable reviews. Even the Virtual Console re-release in 2008 remained exclusively westward. Within the game's files are two voice clips that are thought to be love notes from staff who worked on the game, one in Japanese and one in English. Emi-chan, And... I love you, Liz. Mario Tennis released in the year 2000 as well, and was the second time Mario was behind the net if you include Mario's Tennis for the Virtual Boy. If for some reason the player decides to turn on the game without plugging a controller in, they're greeted with a humorous image featuring Waluigi and Luigi. This image was put in place to ask the player to reset the console and plug their controllers in. The accompanying music is the Match Point theme. Clay Fighter 63 and a third, the third title in the Clay Fighter series, was developed by Interplay and released in 1997. There was originally going to be a character in the title that went by the name Hobocop, a clear play on the titular character from the movie Robocop. The character was adorned with pots and trash can lids and would have some pretty risque animations, especially for Nintendo, like urinating on the stage and exposing himself to his opponent. Though Hobocop did appear in promotional material for the game, as well as in beta footage, he was not included in the game's final release. A rent-only blockbuster exclusive version of the game also exists, called Clay Fighter Sculptor's Cut. This version included several other previously cut characters, though still lacked the inclusion of Hobocop. This was apparently because Nintendo did not approve of the character, believing that he was too controversial. Hobocop can also be seen in footage from a prototype demo for the unreleased PlayStation version called Clay Fighter Extreme that was planned to be released at the same time as the Nintendo 64 version, so it's likely he would have been a unique character to that release. Another noteworthy N64 title is Jet Force Gemini, which was developed by Rare and released in 1999. The game was well received, and much like its rare predecessors, Perfect Dark and Conker's Bad Fur Day was set to have a Game Boy Color title in its series. The game would have been a top-down isometric 2D shooter, with heroes Juno and Lupus searching for Juno's twin sister, Vela. However, the game was cancelled before it was even announced. This was probably due to lack of interest in Rare's previous portable endeavours and the age of the Game Boy console itself. In an October 2012 interview, former Rare designer and producer Martin Wakeley said, Jet Force Gemini on the Game Boy was the only occasion I can remember Rare outsourcing anything. It was being done by Bit Studios and was nearly done last time I saw it. I'm not sure what happened to it. In 2006, a prototype of the game was found and was said to be, quote, nearly complete. Mr. Pants, Rare's unofficial mascot, makes his appearance in one way or another in every Rare game, and Jet Force Gemini is no exception. After the player collects 300 ant heads, the cheat, Pants as Ants, is unlocked. When active, all the blue ants in the game are replaced with Mr. Pants. He is also drawn on one of the walls in the Torfret Castle level. And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we'll be looking at Atlas's Xbox exclusive Shin Megami Tensei 9. Two demons that were originally planned to appear in the game were scrapped before its final release, Megami Izanami and Fiend Tokusada. Both characters had artwork created for them by Kazuma Kaneko, however, it was unfortunately put aside. The characters would eventually make their way into the franchise, however. Tokisada would go on to appear in Shin Megami Tensei Imagine and Shin Megami Tensei 4 as an ally as well as a boss. Izanami finally made their debut in Shin Megami Tensei 4 and plays a large role in Persona 4. However, their design does differ from the original artwork. Chad Barnum, your mission is to infiltrate the Clefairy headquarters and get Corey Nelson to talk. Seems easy. Why not send Trevor Wooden or Malcavio? Robert Cox has left the three master gamers in charge of defense. Ex-members of the Patreon squad will be in your way. First, you have the Phantom Sonic, with his ability to run through walls. Mike Sinistar, with his evil amplification. And finally, your boy Beowulf. <laughs> Need I say more? Oh, God. 
Once you're in, try and find Maximilian Summers. He will have intel on the NAP security systems. Where would I find him? Look for the Vitas Varnas terminal. Our last agent, Guillermo Chavez, left all the intel there before Jedistot 7 stabbed him in the back. I need not remind you that this is your last chance to end all of this before they put Operation Skunk Starlight in motion. Good luck. That's all for today. Thank you for watching. We really hope you enjoyed the video. We really like making them. And, uh, you know, we appreciate you watching them. We're not perfect. We don't always go spot on. But we just, we just want to make stuff for you to enjoy. Especially for our patrons. They're wonderful people. They're really cool. I was having a chat with one the other day. And he's like, bro, I'm, su I'm super cool. And I was like, I know. That's a true story. But it's, I mean, it's not. But it's not outside the realms of possibility, I suppose.